Hey everybody, welcome to today's video. We are going to do a review of The Last Jedi movie. There will be spoilers, a lot of big spoilers. So I still want to kind of do a roundtable discussion because I want to tackle some of these plot holes and complaints that people have been having that I've been seeing around not just the community but like Star Wars fandom in general and I'd love to get together a, a, a few Jedi and sit down and kind of talk about these complaints especially since they, they kind of deal with Luke Skywalker and his progression of a Jedi and, and, and things of that nature. However, I figured I'd go ahead and do this review. I originally was going to tackle all these plot holes and complaints myself, but it, it just got into this really long, it was like an hour long video. And so I figured why not just focus on the things that I did like about it. Overall, I felt this was a great addition and, and carried on from where we left off. Now, The Force Awakens, I felt, had really good visual storytelling. I felt the direction in that uh, movie was, was top-notch because, like, you look at things that we know about the character, like, you look at Rey, and everything we know about her, especially when people start complaining about her character, and we'll get to that later, but when people start complaining about her character, they're not looking at this visual storytelling that was going on in The Force Awakens. There's a lot we learn about Rey in the opening scenes without any words, without any narration. It's all there visually for us to pick up on. This movie didn't quite have that level of visual storytelling I felt. But what I felt it did capture was the pacing, the speed of the movie. You're always in the story. The Force Awakens, you start and you keep moving along. There's no point where you're kind of just like looking at the clock, or at least I wasn't, right? Like I was always in the story. It moved at a great pace, I felt like. A pacing issue that I have in any movie was present twice in The Last Jedi, and it's a general pet peeve of mine. It's not, it's necessary for storytelling, right? It's about building suspense. I get this. Stop trying to build suspense unnecessarily. And I felt this happen in the opening sequence of The Last Jedi with the bombers. I didn't have an issue with space gravity. I can easily explain those, but again, we'll get to that hopefully in another video. But the whole suspense, the build up, the long delay, the timing of, is it gonna blow up the ship? Are they gonna get the bombs? Like it was all unnecessary. That's a normal pet peeve of mine. That, that, that happens in every movie. Uh, it usually uh, elicits an eye roll from me, but that's about it. It doesn't take me out of the movie and it certainly doesn't make me feel like, oh, this movie sucks because of it. I get it, suspenseful storytelling. I just don't, <laughs> just like, come on. God, well, get to it, get to it. But overall, the pacing was was good. Even with things like Canto Bite, I know like some people didn't enjoy that diversion, if you will. I felt it kept up with the movie. I felt it kept speed with the movie. I didn't feel taken out of it. I wasn't like, ugh. I was more eye rolling, like get to it with the bomber sequence than I was with Canto Bite. Likewise, another pet peeve of mine in movies is, is the delayed reaction. Again, it's suspense, but I, I dislike delayed reaction. So when the transports were heading down to the planet, there's Admiral Holdo on the, on the bridge of the ship. And my first thought right away was maneuver your ship with shields and buy them time, buy them cover. You're just watching ships die. And again, it's storytelling, it's suspenseful buildup. I get it. I understand why it's there cinematically and for, for runtime and all that, but it is just a pet peeve of mine. Like if I can think of a, an immediate reaction, but which wouldn't have solved the overall problem in the story, right? But we'll, again, hopefully we'll get there with another video. It didn't take me out of the movie. In fact, it got me into the movie even more. It's, it's one of those pet peeves where I'm like, why like react? Like I want the character to move, you know? I love the character development in this one. Again, I thought it was a great continuation of where we were. And I really loved how the characters progressed and they each had their own kind of development. That development isn't always what people want. Like there's a lot of complaints about Kylo Ren and General Hux, how they're weak threats and things like that. And again, I don't agree with that, but I think it, their character development is solid. Yeah, you, Kylo Ren is this unmasked emotional kid, but that's kind of the, the point, right? The point is he didn't really mature from that moment in time with Luke. 
He didn't mature from that incident, really. He's been under the, the boot of this other guy, still being his. He just switched schooling. He just switched masters, really, and he never really grew from that. And what's great in this movie is that we see it, and I think he begins to realize it, or realizes it, you know, somewhere in, in the movie, that no, he's not Darth Vader. And I think the viewers miss that. This is the point of Kylo Ren, that he was trying to be Darth Vader, that he was trying to live up to that. And no, absolutely not. He is not Darth Vader. He is just not. We're given a glimpse of him in his Vader moment in the beginning of The Force Awakens. But he is unmasked and shown not to be Vader. And but he's still hanging on to that identity, to that goal, to that idea. And Snoke is, is you, like holding that over him and using that as a driving factor. And I felt one of the big core moments for him was realizing that he's not Darth Vader, that he's, that he's never gonna be Darth Vader. That's not who he is. That's not who he so, should try to be. That's not who he's supposed to be. He needs to develop as himself. And I think it was a growing moment. I thought it was great character development. I feel you can say this with all of the characters. Now, I really like Luke in this one. I, as most people who know me well, understand that I've never really uh, connected with Luke. I love the original trilogies. I, I enjoy them. Empire Strikes Back is still one of my favorite movies, but I always felt Luke was whiny and, and irresponsible. So seeing him, in this movie, I love Luke in this movie. Now, I loved his yoda in moments. I loved his Jedi Hermit lifestyle. I thought it was funny. I thought it, I thought it set up a good... I thought it represented Jedi Hermits perfectly. He's not the first in Star Wars canon. He's not the first Jedi Hermit to wander off in a cave for the Jedi community. And I felt it was captured well. Not only that, it makes sense within the story. This is a person, I know in the movie he says, I came here to die, but that doesn't speak to the truth, I don't think. Again, that, that's said in those moments where he's trying to tell Rey, like, get lost, I've given up, this and that. But if you look at the story, him and Ben, in their backstory, in which I loved how it was done, by the way. Here's one version, here's another version. Oh, look, here's the truth in the middle. Got a little mixture of both they both go running in search of answers after that moment, right? It's a pivotal moment for both people. It's another Luke moment. It's another cave moment for him. And he failed for the briefest of instance. He has this cave moment, the fear of unleashing another Darth Vader upon the galaxy. And how far would he be willing to go to, to stop that from happening? It's a very, it, it makes sense. That's a real fear for, I think, all Jedi mentors. And he had to face it, and he failed for the briefest of moments. And in that pivotal moment for both characters, they go searching in opposite directions for answers. Ben goes to Snoke, because he's that was already his thing. Which, by the way, why do Jedi let their apprentices hang out with creepy old dudes? I'll never know. But... Yeah, so Ben goes running off to, to Snoke for answers, and Luke goes running in search of the first Jedi Temple for answers to figure this out. As even Mark Hamill has said, even in his criticism, he felt Luke would come back from that moment and try to help the galaxy, which I fully believe that was the original intent. He, you don't go searching for the first Jedi Temple to die. You, that's not what you go, you go searching there for answers, for, for something to help you out, for something to make sense of everything that happened, and maybe for a way back, how did previous Jedi deal with this, how did previous Jedi resolve it, and then to find the history of the Jedi is riddled with wayward apprentices unleashing darkness on the galaxy, then that's disheartening, that's disillusionment, especially you know, considering the legacy that you're from. And from that point, that's when he comes to the conclusion that the Jedi must end because the Jedi have messed up 
many times in the past. And, and that's a fair conclusion to come to. If, if over the course of history, this thing keeps every once in a while creating a galaxy shaking event that causes pain and suffering for, for billions uh, of people in the galaxy, of course you would consider this needs to end certainly needs to change, right? I know a lot of people were hoping for that, for a reformation of the Jedi Order, and I think we still might get that. We might get, as, as another Jedi, Jedi Alex Berg pointed out, we might get a much more Jedi boots on the ground, hands in the muck, up to the elbow kind of Jedi. Ones that are in the galaxy, ones that are, that are in the mix, right? And I think we still might get that because one of the things, one of the problems this highlights is something that we've talked about in regards to real life Jedi temples. Being a Jedi isn't about finding a temple in the wilderness and, and, and disappearing and, and going for enlightenment. It's great to have a retreat, a place to go to, to recharge, and then to get right back out there. And I think that's always like the original intent of the temple, but when it becomes your base of operations and then the people who make decisions are staying there all the time and they're kind of removed from the workings of the galaxy and they're not out there with, you know, up to the elbows in, in, in getting work done, then you start to separate, you start to separate yourself. So removing yourself from society isn't, isn't the answer. And I felt this movie kind of addressed that, it talks about that. Luke has removed himself at the first Jedi Temple, and he's not involved. He's even gone so far to cut himself off from the Force. And it's this essence of seclusion that is the issue. It is this idea of hubris. And Luke's failing in hubris as well. If I don't intervene, if I end, if I die, I solve this problem. That's not how that works. The problem's there. You have to create solutions. Which Yoda's part, sorry, love Yoda showing up. Love the moment. This is all Luke's moment, right? Luke, again, has to go through the hero's journey. The hero's journey is not a one cycle deal, okay? A lot of people love Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, but they think it's singular. It's not singular. You are gonna be going through that again and again. Not only that, you're gonna go through that while you're going through a bigger hero's journey. It's, it's not over, okay? Just because you've confronted one demon and you've overcome one obstacle and you've gone through the underworld and you come back out on top, doesn't mean you won't face another one down the road. And this movie again highlights that. The hero's journey is not singular and you have to grow from each moment so that you are better prepared in the future. But that doesn't mean you're going to be able to handle everything as a golden boy hero because you overcame this other thing and this other obstacle in your life. There's going to be new challenges. There's going to be new things that are going to throw a monkey wrench in your plans. And you have to be able to deal with that as a, as a Jedi. Again, I felt Luke does this. He goes in search of answers. He goes back to basics, right? He wants to go back to the, to the Jedi text that started it all. He wants to learn from the ancient masters and, and grow. But he doesn't like what he finds. He reaches disillusionment, which a lot of people in the Jedi community can relate to, right? Usually councils and masters and all this stuff. And you see all this drama happening in the community and, and just like culture issues going on at websites. And you're like, this is, this is internet culture. This isn't Jedi culture. And, and there's disillusionment and there's falling out of favor of the path and just wanting to walk away and just wanting to, to hermit yourself away, just wanting to study the stuff on your own. This is all stuff we can relate to. This is all stuff that makes sense. So absolutely within the movie, I felt it made a, a lot of sense and that it was a great moment. And, and so when Luke is walking through the blast doors, walking through the flames to face down the First Order's army with his laser sword, I thought that was an epic moment. I was tearing up. I was like, probably the first time in my life that I'm cheering for Luke. And was like, dude, that's, that's where it's at. He comes back around and he understands the importance of his legacy, understands the importance of a legend. And then the, the big thing that people didn't like was him dying, but I was like, that's perfect. That's perfect. He lets go of the crude matter 
and he becomes much more powerful than they can imagine. And he now has the opportunity to better affect the development of the Jedi. We see that Yoda's still around after all these years, right? So we know that a Jedi can stick around and, and help shape the future of the Jedi, can help shape the direction they go and pass on their lessons still. So I feel this opens Luke up to much more screen time, potentially. I don't know if they'll utilize them that way or if they'll go more of Ben route with just a few scenes here and there, but it does open it up that he can be a guiding force for good. He can, he can help establish the resistance in the, in the Jedi to come in a much more unrestricted way. So I, I felt it was a good direction to go. I felt it worked. Unlike Mark Hamill, this is my Luke. I felt this captured the Jedi ideals perfectly. I thought it, it offered a lot of good Jedi lessons. His lessons on why the Jedi should end, I felt were great and missed the point, right? I loved his thing on the, on the Force, that the Force is always there. It, and that's, that's wonderful. Luke in the expanded universe in Legends once said that the Force is like a river and the Jedi is but one cup to drink from and that there's room for plenty of cups. So it makes sense because I feel this is saying the same thing. However, to say that because other options are available, the Jedi aren't needed or shouldn't exist is where it goes wrong. And this can translate into real life as well. There are many great paths out there. There's many great religions, philosophies, practices, martial arts, things of that nature that one could follow, live a very beneficial and positive life. It doesn't require people to live as a Jedi, but that doesn't mean our path is insignificant. Doesn't mean our path isn't necessary. Doesn't mean we should just go follow something else, right? Just because other options exist doesn't negate the other options that are out there. So I felt that was a, it was a great lesson. It's a great way to connect with the force. I loved it. You know, that's why we have a meditation on it. His lesson on hubris, great moment but misses the point because Jedi teachings aren't about hubris. Jedi teachings aren't about pride. There's Jedi teachings on humility. There's Jedi teachings on modesty. And there's Jedi teachings on, on patience, understanding, recovering from failure. There's all these lessons that warn against arrogance, overconfidence. Jedi thought isn't about hubris. Jedi thought isn't about that. And, and again, that goes kind of the ego passing blame onto the order when blame rests more with yourself. I, when I've gone through personal challenges and things of that nature, I felt the community has let me down in the past, but the path didn't. I let myself down because I wasn't adhering to the path. There's a reason why I found myself uh, sitting in darkness, not moving anywhere, not moving forward, and just kind of wallowing, was because I wasn't living the path. I wasn't. I wasn't adhering to the practices. I wasn't following the teachings. I was just sitting there. I wasn't moving. And I feel that's a, that's a very similar lesson of what's going on. Also, I loved Ray's progression and character development. Again, people want to still go with the overpowered Mary Sue angle. Uh, I feel that misses a lot of things from The Force Awakens, but it also misses things here. And again, hopefully in another video, we can, we can sit down and talk about how just how off that is, but if someone wants to come in and try to try to take that angle, I'm all for it. But in this one, we see Rey struggling and making wrong choices continually. She fails in the cave. She she doesn't listen to Luke. She goes rushing off because she believes in the legend of Luke Skywalker, right? Like it's all tied together. She grew up on the stories of Luke Skywalker and and his redemption of Anakin Skywalker and it goes to also Jedi lessons that that Yoda used from Empire Strikes Back and Luke says I don't believe it. Yoda's like that's why you fail. One of the great things that we know about Rey is that she grew up on these legends, she grew up on these stories, we know why and we'll get to that in a second, but we know why she put so much stock and hope into these stories and really grabbed onto them with that childlike mentality, right? 
but no one's told her she can't do these things. Once she learns she has this power, she knows the stories of what this great power can do, right? But no one told her she can't. She doesn't have that failure mentality. So when she is confronted with an obstacle, such as lifting rocks, well, no one told her she there's a weight limit or she can't do this. And it goes right back to, to Yoda's lesson. And I feel that's a, another wonderful Jedi moment saying, you know, that really focus determines your reality, your beliefs and your connection to the force play a part. So I really felt like those moments were good. I felt her, her progression and her failure, her continual failure was good. On just a quick note, because someone said, you know, that Ray beat Luke uh, physically. That didn't happen. People need to go back and watch. What happened was Ray does attack Luke. Luke defends himself one-handed very easily with an antenna, while Ray, which we know to be a skilled fighter, is using her staff, which she's very comfortable with, and still gets disarmed. And at that point, she lashes out, grabs a lightsaber. Obviously, lightsaber versus antenna, I would jump back too. So, all that makes sense. Uh, Luke wasn't overpowered by Rey, just, just to clear that up. And again, we can go with old man not keeping up with his Jedi practices versus a uh, young person very much assured in their abilities. So. Ray, and then we could talk about Ray. I liked Ray's parents. I liked that revelation. I liked Ray's parents uh, being no one, being, being more than no one, being degenerates. I like that. I think it makes the most sense for her character. It highlights why she would hang on to hope, why she would invest in stories, why she would lie to herself about her parents. And, and anybody who's kind of felt that abandonment you know, there's hope. There's these beliefs that you're you're out of place, and someone's going to recognize you for the special person you are. That you're gonna be recognized, and someone's gonna come and find you, or someone's gonna come back for you, and and you are gonna be you know recognized as a special person who's loved and was missed and is needed. And those are, those are real things that people deal with. And so it makes sense for her character and it makes sense for her character development. And it just works. I had fun with all the fan theories too about who her parents were, but when it came down to it, that's what I was actually hoping for. I was hoping for Ray's parents to be, to be no. If it wasn't, if it happened, she was a Skywalker or whatever crazy theory uh, that was thrown out there, I wouldn't have minded that either as long as it was done well. I felt this one was done well. It's, it feels like that same kind of issue that The Empire Strikes Back originally had where Vader reveals he is Luke's father and at, by the end of the movie people still didn't believe it. They're like, no, that's, that's a trick, that's a lie, that's, that's not reality. And I feel this one kind of gives us that same thing to argue about because we don't we don't know fully. I mean, it, it seems like it's pretty pretty much acknowledged within the film. It seems Ray pretty much affirms that within the film. So that seems uh, seems accurate. Seems right. I like it. I felt it. I felt it works for the character. Again, all this character progression. I like Finn's character progression. Love Finn, and I liked his character progression. As he was heading towards the cannon, I was, I was, tears were dropping down because I was like, ah, oh, you get him, man. You get, I was okay with it. I was sad, but I was, I was okay with it. I was like, you get him. And, uh, but I, I loved his uh, character progression. And so, so I like that. I like Poe's character progression. Again, there's, there's issues with, with him and Admiral Holdo. But again, hopefully we'll get to that in another, another video in a round table where we can sit down and talk, talk it out. But I liked all of it. I felt it was in line. I didn't feel there was any plot holes. Another complaint is, is Leia's quote unquote Mary Poppins moment. Didn't ruin it for me. Didn't pull me out of it. I 100% I, I Star Wars cheese, but you know, 
that happens in every Star Wars movie everywhere. There's always a, a cheesy moment, and that was certainly the quota filled. And I like I liked it though. Like it didn't bother me. I felt it actually acknowledges certain things about her character that quite obviously she did get some instruction from Luke, not as an apprentice or anything, but certainly some instruction, kind of like Legends, right? In Legends, she she trained a bit as a Jedi and was like, you know what, this this isn't for me. This is my arena. I'm gonna go to politics because that's where I'm at. That's what I like. That's what I'm good at. Jedi life isn't for me. And I felt this kind of shows that. She has a much stronger connection to the Force. She's much more in tune with it. And I felt that that really highlights that. And it, yeah, maybe the way it's done isn't the best, but I felt it works. Porgs, love them. I find that, I think they're adorable. Same with the Volpexes. Uh, I think they're adorable. I uh, think it's just world building. Some people had complaints about that, but I would say Salacious Crumb had no vital part in Return of the Jedi. The Bith Cantina Band in A New Hope, no vital part of the story. It's, it's called universe building, it's world building, and I enjoyed it. The reasons why the Porgs kind of came about, I felt was interesting. You know, they just decided to CGI over the puffins on the island. So I thought that was a, a kind of cool tidbit and development, but overall, even if that wasn't the case, I liked them. I liked how they were used. I thought they were fun. I thought it was good world building. The got milk cow, again, uh, you know, you gotta, it, it, it's a great moment. It, it's definitely in my top yuck moments, but certainly it's a fun moment that, again, Luke's yoda -ing, I felt was a great representation of Jedi Hermits who don't want the responsibility of messing up anymore. I've been there. Smaller scale, on a much smaller scale I've been there. And I've refused to, to teach and things because I'm like, obviously I'm no good at this thing. Obviously it's just gonna end in this this continual scenario. So I'm not going to I'm not going to partake. So I get it. And, and I, I enjoyed it. Overall, I just enjoyed it. I, I just keep coming back to that. I keep coming back to the fact, I, I look at the complaints, I look at the supposed plot holes, uh, and I've watched it, I've watched it a couple times now, and with those complaints in mind, and I just don't see it. I just don't get any of the issues. So overall, overall, I really enjoyed the movie. I loved the main characters. I loved everything that, uh, uh, about the movie. I felt it had good pacing. Good character development. I feel it leaves us off at a good spot to continue on. Let's let's try to remember this is not the end, right? We are not at the end part. So I feel this is a good middle ground. I feel this really does a, a lot of great stuff. It builds up the universe. So like I said, I really want to get to a roundtable discussion where we'll actually have a, a few people live with us, like on camera, as well as you can join in the live chat. So it'll be a live event, so you can join in the chat and you can you can add your two cents, you can type it out, you know, you, you can get involved, you can agree, you can disagree, you can yell, whatever, whatever you want. Of course, as always, you can comment below and give your thoughts on The Last Jedi. You know where the buttons are, you can like, dislike, subscribe, bell, unsubscribe, block, whatever makes you happy. May the force be with you. Um, um, uh, uh, um, 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 uh